but he soon grew to 750 pounds and became such a celebrity in our little town that he would get write-in votes at every election. I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Cy Montgomery is a naturalist and an author and has been a friend to the aquarium for many years, working closely with staff, volunteers, and animals. She's worked closely with New England Aquarium. Her international bestseller, The Soul of an Octopus, was researched largely at the aquarium. One of her books for younger readers, Amazon Adventure, stars aquarium uh, aquarist Scott Dowd and showcases his conservation work in Brazil with Project Piaba. We appreciate that Sai continues to highlight issues and animals that increase public awareness of our natural world and the systems we all rely on so both humans and oceans can thrive. Uh, please join me in welcoming Sai. Thank you so much for that great introduction and thank you all for letting me be here with you tonight in one of my very favorite places on the face of the earth, our New England Aquarium. I think I'm the luckiest person on this planet because look what I get to do. I get to hang out with you guys, get to hang out with sorts like this <laughs> that do not try this at home. Um, this, this is a, an ambassador cheetah at Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia where I went to research a book. Uh, the animal was um, an orphan and uh, raised to be an ambassador by a woman who quit her job and moved to Namibia in order to save an animal she felt was endangered. I've also been lucky enough in my work to make seven trips to the Amazon. The first was in search of this beautiful creature. This is a pink river dolphin. It sounds like something that you'd see after too many martinis. <laughs> my mother kept saying, how are those pink elephants you're working on? But they are real, and they do live in rivers, and they really are dolphins. And it is said that these dolphins have magical powers, and that they will come up out of the water, turn into people, or look like people, although they usually wear a hat to disguise the blowhole, and they'll seduce you to come beneath the waters to, to the enchanted world that is so beautiful you will never want to leave. Well, it is true in its enchanted world, and I came back time after time. And most recently, I was there with someone you may recognize. This is Scott Dowd. Um, he runs our freshwater gallery. And I was there researching a book on these beautiful little creatures, tiny, tiny fishes that twinkle like stars in the night. And I guess you'll have to read the book to find out how they might save the Amazon. I made another trip to Brazil to meet this individual. Isn't that the cutest little thing? That's a baby tapir. Looks like a watermelon that like <laughs> mated with my nose. Um, there's actually a tapir named after me, and I'm going to show you the most glamorous picture ever of Sai. <laughs> Don't you like that elegant collar? So for my work, I get to go to dry land as well. I've ventured to the Gobi Desert looking for these animals. We did not find them. We found their scat. Now you know that you're a star when people are thrilled to find your scat. Um, and in India's great mangrove swamp, I got to meet these tigers, the only man-eating tigers on the face of the earth. They will swim out after your boat and get on board and eat you. So naturally, that's where I wanted to go. My husband was concerned, but I told him, don't worry, honey, they're man eaters. <laughs> but I also get to hang out with individuals such as this. So that, was, that book, Soul of an Octopus, was researched right here at our aquarium. Well, you may be wondering, how could I be so lucky as to do this kind of thing for a living. And my answer is that I've believed in a saying that has served as a promise for my entire life. And it goes like this. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And that promise is as good for you as it was for me. 
Now it sounds like you're sitting quietly in the classroom and in comes your teacher. And I have had wonderful teachers in my life. One of them I'd just like to introduce you to, Mr. Clarkson, who at my second high school was my journalism teacher. So in classrooms, we do meet wonderful teachers. But the great news is that they're not just in classrooms. Teachers are around us all the time. And sometimes they have two legs, but they don't look like Mr. Clarkson. Sometimes they have four legs. Sometimes they have eight legs or arms. And sometimes they don't have any legs at all. Animals are fantastic teachers. And this is something that people have understood for a great long time. Humans have recognized for millennia that animals are our teachers. And here is an animal who most Native American nations have recognized as great teachers for a very, very long time. In many Native American nations, the bear is recognized as the animal who taught their own medicine men and medicine women the use of healing herbs. And at first you might dismiss that as a just so story that's just made up or silly superstition, but that's not so. Bears do use plants as medicine and they are doing it today. And by carefully watching animals' behavior, you can learn many of the plants that have medicinal properties. To this day, there are bears that you can find that are methodically stripping the bark off willow trees. I read of this once, a, a hunter who was watching this, who was curious to see why is the bear stripping the bark off the willow tree? Being a hunter, he shot that bear. And when he came to the carcass, he pulled back the bear's lips and saw that the willow tree bark was all scrunched up and it was all around a single tooth. Pushed it away from that tooth and saw the tooth above it had a horrible abscess, a big painful swelling. So what was the willow bark doing? Well, willow bark is a source of salicylic acid, which is the active ingredient that makes our aspirin work. So it is true that today, um, Native American people don't necessarily have to go to the drugstore when they've got a headache or a toothache. They can just make willow bark tea. And they've learned a great deal from watching animals. And so have I. Because animals have powers that we either don't know or can't access or don't understand. And only recently have we begun to explain. For instance, elephants just Gosh, it was maybe 40 years ago, it was discovered that elephants can communicate across vast distances using sounds below the threshold of human hearing. Dr. Katie Payne, in accompaniment with my friend Elizabeth Marshall Thomas and Dr. William Langbauer, discovered this. And it explained something that had confused and mystified people for many years. Because when elephants were being poached, in one area of Africa, inexplicably in another area, elephants would become agitated and run away. And it was because they could hear this infrasonic call transmitting the information that the poachers had been there. Sharks, too, have superpowers that we have never attained. They have, right around their lips, they have like little freckles. They're called the ampullae of Lorenzini, which is just a great thing to say to your friends. <laughs> so if you see a person with a freckle, you can always ask, is that an ampullae of Lorenzini, or is that a freckle? What they do with these is they can detect electrical signals. In fact, these guys can detect the electrical signal of the heartbeats of their prey. And this is just starting to touch on some of the amazing powers that animals have. Well, one day, um, I was interviewed by a dear friend who many of you may know her work. Vicki Croak had a, a, a program um, on Boston Public Radio, and she also had a, a video component of the program. 
and she came to our house, my husband's my house in Hancock, New Hampshire, to interview me about some of these animals' powers, the animals that I have met while researching, gosh, I think it's up to 28 books at this point, or 29. And I was delighted to discuss all this with her. At the end of the interview, though, she had one last question that I'd never been asked before, and it was this. She said, Sai, I've just been learning all this great natural history about these wonderful animals, but have the animals taught you anything about your life, about how to live your life? Have they taught you any life lessons that you've taken inside you, that changed you personally? And if so, what have they taught you? And I didn't take very long to realize my answer was what they have taught me is how to be a good creature. And that was the name of the next book that I ended up writing. My editor happened to see that video archived online and she called me up and she said, you've got to write this book. And I said, oh no, it's a memoir. And I hate to write memoir. Some of you may know The Good Good Pig. That's my, a memoir of my life with a wonderful pig. But it's hard to write about yourself and it's scary to write about yourself. And besides, I mean, I don't even like to look in the mirror, as you can probably tell. And it, it just did not appeal to me at all. But then I realized, you know, the animals in my life have helped me with struggles that aren't mine alone. The animals that I have known have helped me with the struggles that we all face. Like, how do you find your destiny? How do you discover what it is that you're meant to do on this planet? And once you know what it is, where's the path to get there? How do we make a family, a loving family around ourselves? How do we forgive those who have hurt us? When a devastating loss strikes, how do we fall in love with life again? And these are some of the questions that animals have helped me to answer. And so I'm gonna share a little bit of that with you tonight. When I was really, really little, just beginning to talk, I was able to voice to my parents a big existential problem. I informed my mother and father that I was not a little girl, but I was in fact a horse. And my mother was horrified and took me to the pediatrician. The pediatrician assured her that this phase would pass. And it did when I realized that, no, no, I really was a dog. <laughs> so my big problem was everyone wanted to teach me how to be a little girl. But I had no interest in this. I wanted to be a dog. And no one was there to teach me to be a dog. Well, when I was little, um, I was ill uh, for quite some time, and my parents were distressed, and nothing they could do would get me to eat or grow or talk, until Molly came into my life. She was a Scottish Terrier. Scottish Terriers are fierce and feral, and they are not usually recommended for tiny children. The reason is that, as Dorothy Parker has pointed out, if they have a collision with a car, the car knows it has had a big problem, no matter who loses. These guys, they, their jaws are the size of that of an Airedale. They're small dogs, but they don't know this. So Molly was, for me, essentially my older sister. Now, she wasn't older than me. As you can see in this picture, we were pups together. But it was very clear to me, as we both grew, that she was an adult long before I was. And she had powers that I could never attain. She could hear at frequencies that I would never hear. She could smell all kinds of information that I could never know. She could see in the dark thanks to the tapetum lucidum in the back of the eye. I could throw a ball into the darkness and hear her jaws close around it, but I couldn't see it. So I daydreamed that one day I would run away into the forest with Molly, and she would be my teacher, and she would tell me all the secrets of the wild animals. 
and I would learn what I deeply wanted to know about the beautiful, wilder world that I knew was out there because we had a television set and I could see that there was life off the army base where I lived with my parents. But she knew about it. She would run at night and come back having had all kinds of adventures that I could not dream of. But one day, one day, I could be as wild as she. One day, I dreamed that I could be as fierce and as feral and as unstoppable as she was. And I could discover great truths about the natural world. Well, she's no longer with us, obviously. One of the great sad things about this world is that our dogs don't live as long as we do. But thanks to her, I did leave. I did live that dream because that's what I'm doing today, thanks to Molly. And I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life, even back then. But the problem was, how would I get there? You can't go to college and major in jungle exploration. <laughs> so I went to college, and I, I actually I triple majored, and one of my majors was magazine journalism. I figured that being a, a journalist, I could meet all the great experts and talk to them about the wild animals who I loved. And I ended up working for a newspaper in, um, in central New Jersey covering science and medicine, which was pretty fabulous. Well, after five years of this, which I loved, my father, ever my champion, gave me this great gift, which was a ticket to Australia. Now, I wanted to go to Australia because it's full of marsupials. And we only have the one, Didelphus virginianus, the opossum here. But as you know, Australia is full of characters like this, the southern hairy-nosed wombat. I know some of you were thinking common wombat, but no. This is the, <laughs> the more endangered southern hairy-nosed wombat. And um, I didn't want to just go on any old vacation. What I did was I joined an organization that I hope you guys have all heard of. It's called Earthwatch. And it's based right here in Massachusetts. If you want to go to earthwatch.org, you can find that they have expeditions all over the globe. They take paying laymen who, for a period of just two weeks, your typical vacation, they can join real scientific teams around the world and help. So that's what I did. I went to, to South Australia to a wombat preserve and worked for two weeks crazy in love with living in a tent and the incredible, beautiful parrots and the, the gorgeous kangaroos were hopping everywhere. And of course, I mean, there's a face that anyone is going to fall in love with. And so after the two weeks were over, Dr. Pamela Parker, who was the head of, who was the, head of the investigation, she said, Sai, I can just see that you're crazy about doing this. I wish I could hire you to be a research assistant. I, I wish I could give you a ticket to come back. She said, I can't, but what I can do is I could buy you food. So I went back to my job and I quit and I got a tent and I moved to the outback where I lived for no money, but I had food. So what was the problem? I lived there for six months and I had no idea what I would do. I had no idea what I would study. So one day I was gathering plants for a, another uh, a graduate student. She was doing a study and I looked up and someone was looking at me. In fact, there were three of these emus looking at me. And as you probably know, emus are those tall, flightless birds. They stand as tall as a man. They, they don't fly. They just have eight-inch wing stumps. But they have incredible legs, and they can carry them 40 miles an hour over the outback. Their legs are strong enough to sever fencing wire with a single kick. And even though the kangaroo stands beside the emu on Australia's coat of arms, I was shocked to learn that no one really knew what they did all day. And I figured I'd find out. So I started following them around, like Jane Goodall. And I let them know I was there. I didn't try to hide. I didn't sneak. And they let me join them. Three emus let me join them walking around the outback. And 
I did a check sheet of every behavior, and it wasn't like I found out they were making stock trades or anything like that. But, you know, and I didn't discover tool use. I did discover they had a fantastic sense of humor, actually. They used to tease the ranger's dog, and they would, they knew the ranger's dog was on a chain. So they, and they knew how long the chain was. So they would walk up to the ranger's dog and they would leap up and they would splash the air with their legs and their little wings would go like this and the dog would be going nuts and running to the end of the chain and then stopping and then being pulled back and they thought this was hilarious. <laughs> but I learned something very important. Not only did I learn now, here's my path to what I want to do for a living. I want to go to where the animals are just as I had dreamed, and I can do it as a writer. I learned that from them. They showed me the path that Molly had first shown me existed. They showed me where it went. And they also showed me another thing, and that was that it's important for us to use our intellect and our knowledge to understand the ways of animals, but that it's also very useful to use your intuition and your emotions. Now, scientists tell you we shouldn't let our emotions come into play. But as a writer, I have found that this is the way to connect your readers with your study animal. And they are the ones who showed me this by causing me to fall deeply, deeply, passionately in love. And I've done this time after time because every animal is worth your whole heart. And they have so much to show us. I owe this guy showing me what family really means. This is Christopher Hogwood. He came home as a little sickly runt. We did not know he was going to make it through the night. Both ends of this pig were runny on the inauspicious day that we brought him home in my lap in a shoebox. But he soon grew to 750 pounds and became such a celebrity in our little town that he would get write-in votes at every election. <laughs> he made all kinds of friends for me. And because I feel so at home in, in our aquarium today, you don't see how shy I am. But I am painfully shy. But he made all my friends in Hancock, New Hampshire, because he would get out of his pen. And then my neighbors, I was new in town, would call up and say, ah, oh, there's a black and white pig on my lawn. Is it yours? And I would run over. And by the time I, I met the people, if there was anything left of their tomato patch, um, they had already made great friends with Christopher Hogwood, and therefore I was their friend too. He too is the guy who taught me about pig spa. We used to hold pig spa in the summertime. And my husband and I, we, we chose not to have any children ourselves due to human overpopulation. But I'd never realized how much fun kids are till Christopher Hogwood taught me. He was the one who attracted the little girls next door over to our yard every single day. And what we would do is that we would scrub him, we would brush him, we would put warm soapy water on him, we would braid the hair on his tail, we would rub this stuff called the hoof maker that's supposed to be for horses' hooves into his hooves till they gleamed, and then we would all eat chocolate donuts. <laughs> so the thing that he taught me, not only was it really great to have kids in your life, but that you don't have to have kids yourself to have kids in your family. And that your family does not have to be made out of blood. It doesn't have to be made even out of marriage. It doesn't have to be you know, opposite sex, same race, religion. And the reason I know this is that my family disowned me for marrying somebody of a different religion. But I made my own family, and some of those in my family just happened to have a flexible nose disc and a curly tail. <laughs> well, it was someone else in our barn who taught me forgiveness was an ermine. This is the white-coated version of the native weasel that we have here in New England. And every Christmas day, I would make a big bowl of 
yummy popcorn to give to our hens. I had raised every one of our hens from little tiny egg-shaped babies who come in the mail. They used to sit on my head and sleep in my sweater and sometimes walk across my keyboard, which explains some of the sentences in my books. If you don't like them, you can blame them on the, on the, on the hens. Well, it was a Christmas morning, the first Christmas after my mother had died, that I went in with this bowl of popcorn to give to my chickens, and one of my chickens was dead on the floor and her head was in the corner. And I went to pick her up by her little scaly legs, and I couldn't pick her up because someone had a hold of her head. And this was who had a hold of her head because this ermine popped his or her head out of a hole in the corner and stared me down. This big of an animal weighs as much as maybe a handful of coins, fearlessly looking into my face as if to say, what have you done with my chicken? Give it back. Well, of course, I thought it was my chicken. And you would have thought that I would have been so angry at that animal for killing someone who I loved. But looking into the face of this beautiful, perfect ermine, I admired the strength. I admired the courage. I admired the ferocity. And I realized in that moment that these were all characteristics that my mother had, my mother who had disowned me. And in that moment, I found it easy to love her again and to completely forgive her and admire her for the wonderful characteristics that she shared with a weasel. Well, in this, in this book, you'll meet several other characters who are a little more exotic, who did not live in my barn, and one of them is a tree kangaroo. Now, that sounds like another one of those pink river dolphins that you only see after a few martinis, but they really are kangaroos who lived in trees. There are 10 species of them. Um, tonight in our audience, we have somebody who knows them very well, um, to whom I dedicated my book on this animal and its study. But this is one of those animals who essentially brought me back to life. I dealt with a very damaging depression for months after my beloved Christopher Hogwood and then my beloved Tess both died within just a few weeks of each other. And it was one of those depressions that my hair fell out, my gums bled, my memory was shot. And I was just thinking, I cannot go on like this. And so I actually made a plan about what to do about that. But first, I had two things I had to do. I had promised that I would write The Good Good Pig, the book in honor of Christopher Hogwood. And the other was to write this book, the book about a woman, Dr. Lee Stabeck, who is devoting her life to preserving these amazing animals. And it was in Papua New Guinea that I fell in love with life again. And this is a message I want to give to those of us in the audience who may be struggling with loss and depression. This is something the animals teach us again and again and again. And it's a lesson that I learned right here in our aquarium with the octopuses who I came to know. Um, and I need to thank Tia Strombeck for these gorgeous pictures of the octopus. Um, this actually is karma. I got to know four octopuses very well. And they were absolutely magical creatures. Some of you may have read The Soul of an Octopus, and if you have, you'll forgive me for telling a story that I tell at the end of that book. But these animals, they are so unlike us that you would think that they were outer space aliens. You know, we are so different from them. We're constrained with our bones. They are not. They have no bones in their whole body, so they can squeeze their baggy, boneless bodies through a tiny opening. An animal who weighs as much as I do can squeeze through an opening the size of an orange. They have a beak like a parrot. They have venom like a snake. They can shoot ink like an old-fashioned pen, and they can taste with all of their body 
including their eyelids, but most exquisitely in their suckers. Their suckers have a pincer grip, which is what we use when we put our thumb and forefinger together. They can untie knots in surgical silk with their suckers. A big adult male octopus whose largest suckers might be three inches in diameter can, with one of those suckers, lift 30 pounds. And I made friends with animals like this, thanks to my friends here at New England Aquarium, including Wilson Menashe, who is with me in the front row, Bill Murphy, whose gallery these animals live in, and Scott Dowd, who actually opened the tank the first time I met my first octopus, and I knew when I left that day I would have to write this book. Well, I'm going to tell you very briefly about my friendship with one of these octopuses whose name was Octavia. And when I first met her, she wanted nothing to do with us. She'd been caught in the wild, as all of our octopuses are. They're not endangered. They, in fact, you know, there's a fishery. There's a legal fishery for octopuses, not just to be eaten by humans, but also to be cut up as bait. So you may think, like, oh, geez, all octopuses should just be living in the wild. But actually, the octopus that lives in the wild and is able to reproduce, that's one octopus out of 100,000. The rest of them do not live long enough to do that, or else we'd be up to our lips in octopuses because they lay 100,000 eggs. But the second most lucky octopus in the world is the one that gets to live at an aquarium where they have interesting things to do, toys to play with. They love the same kinds of toys our children do. They love Mr. Potato Head. They love to play with Legos. And Wilson Menashe designed these great puzzle boxes for them to play with. So they have something to keep the octopus occupied. Because if they're not occupied, they're going to get into mischief. For instance, you may have heard the stories of octopuses that will climb out of their tank, go into the adjacent tank, eat everyone in there, and then crawl back into their tank. <laughs> well, Octavia was a very smart individual, and we found this out one day when a radio crew had come to interview me about an article I'd written about the octopuses in Orion magazine. And Living on Earth Radio came, and a whole crew got to meet Octavia, and we were petting her, and we were feeding her fish, and she was changing color, looking into our eyes. Her arms and suckers were tasting our hands and arms, and we thought, this is just great. And at one point, we thought, you know what, let's, let's give her another fish. And we looked around. The bucket was gone. <laughs> she stole a bucket right out from under our noses and was holding it underneath her. That's how smart they are. <laughs> and they certainly recognize individual people. And this was known from scientific experiments done at Seattle Aquarium. They, they dressed two of their volunteers, you know, I identically dressed. So the octopus is just looking up through the water at their faces. And one set of volunteers always saw the octopus and gave a delicious fish. The other set of volunteers always touched the octopus with a bristly stick, which they don't like. And then, after a few times, the volunteers left their fish at home, but just leaned over to look at the octopus. The octopus looked up and came over like, oh, that's my friend. The other octopuses that had been trained with the bristly stick people, those octopuses took one look at bristly stick people, even though they were dressed identically to fish people. And they were like, no, I'm getting out of here. But often they would blast that person in the face with freezing cold salt water first. So it was a real privilege to see Octavia turn bright red and slide over to the tank to greet me. It was wonderful to have her arms come boiling up out of the water and her beautiful white grasping suckers to reach for my arms. And by this point, my husband already knew that I was coming home from the aquarium full of hickeys. <laughs> and he knew why. But then one day, we came in and discovered that Octavia had laid eggs. Now, her eggs weren't fertile, but she still tended them as a mother octopus would. And it was bittersweet because octopuses lay eggs at the end of their lives. The last thing they do for the last months of their lives, they don't even leave their lair. 
they just tend the eggs. They're using their funnel to clean them and fluff them and protect them from any predators. Of course, here there were no predators in her tank, but she, she was on the lookout just in case. So no more would she look up at us through the water. She was inside of her lair. No more could we even feed her from our hands. We could feed her on the end of a, of a stick, um, but she was not looking at us anymore. She was not interacting with us anymore. She was all about her eggs. And she stayed on those eggs six months, which is as long as it would take to hatch in the wild. They didn't hatch. They weren't fertile. She stayed steadfastly there six months, seven months, eight months, nine months. The thing about octopuses is that these guys only live three to five years. So nine months is like decades to an octopus. Well, once she got so old and like people, she just began to fall apart. So Bill took her off exhibit, put her behind the scenes so that people wouldn't be looking at her anymore. And Wilson and I went in and we wondered if she'd recognize us because she hadn't seen us for the equivalent of decades. And plus she's an octopus. And we unscrewed the top of the, the tank that she was in and to our amazement, even though she was old and sick and soon to die, she came to the top to greet us. And we handed her a fish, and she had no interest in it. She just dropped it to the bottom. She came up to see us and to hold on to us and to taste our skin and look into our faces one last time. And this is a friendship between beings separated by half a billion years of evolution. And to me, perhaps more than any other animal I have known. It proves the truth of this wonderful saying that's attributed to Thales of Miletus, who was a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher. And he said this, the universe is alive and has fire in it and is full of gods. And to me, what that means is that our world, our beautiful blue planet is deserving of more love than we could ever summon. It is full of individuals thinking and feeling and loving their incandescent lives just as much as we love our own. And that we owe it to this planet to cherish it and realize it is far more sacred and far more holy than we could possibly imagine. Thank you. The question was, have I ever been disappointed by um, any of the animals that I've, I've met? You know, sometimes the first time you, you meet an animal, they don't want to have anything to do with you because they just met you. Um, most, of, most of the time, if you're quiet, you know, an animal will come over um, or at least you'll get to look at it. There have certainly been times when I was disappointed because I was unable to see an animal. And when I went to Shunderman to see the, um, to, to see the man-eating tigers, I mean, some people really don't want to see a man-eating tiger for obvious reasons, but I was afraid I wouldn't see one. And I did see just one, but that was in four trips. So in that way, I was disappointed. But here was the great thing. The great thing was that I learned that animals still show us and still teach us stuff, even if they're not physically there. There's so much you can learn from scats or footprints. There's so much you can learn from talking to the people who live close to the earth and who know about those animals. So even when an animal disappoints you because you were unable to see it, um, you still learn something. And you know, some, some lessons are painful lessons too. Um, 
I'm thinking of the time I had hundreds of leeches sucking my blood. Um, but that's a lesson. That's the <laughs> <laughs> so some you know sometimes you know you hear the the answer to your to your prayer is no. Sometimes the lessons that the animals want to teach you, you you don't get it at first. Sometimes it takes takes a while, but they're always there, and I trust in them. I totally trust in them. And you know, when I'm writing, a lot of times I feel like I don't know how many of you are writers, but sometimes I feel like, oh my gosh, I'm not good enough to write this thing, and I'm disappointing me. I'm looking at the blank screen. Well, when I can't believe in myself, I can believe in my teachers, and that always gets me out of it. This was, um, other than the giant Pacific octopus, which is the octopus we have here, have there been other octopuses that I've interacted with? And yes, I learned to scuba dive specifically so that I could meet wild octopuses. And let me tell you, anybody in this room could scuba dive if I can. <laughs> I had to be the most thrashing around badly, but, but I, I learned, I learned. So um, I got to uh, spend quite a bit of time with what they call the Pacific Blue Octopus, um, which is a tropical species. And in fact, gosh, we're in, we're in June now. Last, no, we're in July. In June, boy, time flies. In, in June, I was with an, an octopus, a, this species, um, who was as close closer to, to me as than I am to you. But um, some of the best interactions I've had with, with octopuses were in Morea, one of the French Polynesian islands. And I went there with uh, a team of octopus experts. Jennifer Mather, who is well known as an octopus psychologist. You ask, like, what does an octopus psychologist do? They give the Rorschach ink block test, right? But um, she's up in, sorry, I could not resist that. Uh, she's in Lethbridge, Canada. And um, a, another fabulous guy, uh, David Scheel, who has, with his graduate students, discovered that the giant Pacific octopus, there's actually two species, one which is we didn't know that there were there were two species, um, and a Brazilian scientist who has discovered new species of octopus, um, and this other person with fabulous vision who worked at the the Vancouver Aquarium. And one of the th it took the longest time for us to see the octopuses though. It's so hard to find them. This is why tons of people who are divers have never seen an octopus. They may have been looking at it but didn't know it was there. Why? Because it looks like the coral or it looks like the hole. Um, and I was afraid that the whole book was going to go by and I wasn't going to see an octopus um, and that we weren't going to do anything in the study either. But actually, she found a whole bunch of them. And one of the last days, this very bold octopus came out and like led us around the whole area. And we could swim with her. We, we knew it was a female because we could look at the third right arm and see that there were suckers all the way in. And um, she was just like giving us a tour. And it was so amazing. But they're such individuals, you know, just like we are. Some are so shy at the Seattle Aquarium, they called one of their octopuses Emily Dickinson. <laughs> but there was another one who was so bold and so grabby, they called him Leisure Suit Larry. <laughs> and I also had an interaction. We, for a while, we had little red octopuses. That's really their name. They're very venomous. They won't kill you, but if they bite you, you will have a very unpleasant experience. And um, I was with Wilson. We were behind the scenes. And you really shouldn't interact with these guys. But this octopus, somehow or another, ended up right on the palm of my hand with her mouth right against the palm of my hand. And that's where the beak is, and that's where the venom is. And so I was like kind of nervous. And I think she was kind of nervous, too. And so I pulled my hand away, and she inked. And I'd never seen somebody ink before. And it was, and neither had Wilson, and it was the coolest thing because she instantly changed color and jetted over there. So your eye, my eye as a horrible predator, which she thought I was, was instantly fixated on the ink blot, which looked just like an octopus. It didn't just look like splat. It looked like 
the, the mantle and head of an octopus and the legs dripping down. And any predator would have been looking right there at that ink. That was really, really cool. So that's a number of different species that I've gotten to know. There's over 200 species of octopus. But I, I haven't met some of the really, have you seen the Dumbo octopus? Oh, that is so cute. And then there's another one called Octopus Adorabilis. <laughs> I'm not kidding, that's, it's, it's pink. I mean, it looks like a plush toy. It's so adorable. Plush toys if they covered them with slime. Which among this crowd might be popular. Okay, she was asking about um, how in Seattle Aquarium, because they are right on the edge of octopus habitat. Um, well, actually, this, these were divers. This wasn't with Seattle Aquarium. It was just in Seattle. It was like Cove, Cove 4 or Cove 7. Um, divers go and visit octopuses. There was a known octopus who had a den there. And uh, divers would visit her and offer her food. Now, she could not leave her den because she wouldn't leave her eggs, but uh, she would accept food from the divers. And she knew who they were. And they actually, I think, were able to film her paralarvae hatching and, and found her, her body after she died just shortly thereafter. But they definitely recognize individual people, and they recognize individual people the same way we do, by looking at the face. And incidentally, this is the way chickens recognize people, too. They've done experiments, and they know that that's how they, they do it. Um, there's a number of sea creatures who recognize individual people in the wild, and others who recognize humans as as good people who can help them. Has anyone seen the recent video of the giant manta ray who had a, a fish hook and line stuck and approached a diver for help? And when we were in Ecuador last month, our dive master had that exact thing happen to her several times. And they know who the good people are. And they're, they're thinking it through. And I love it that we can sometimes help these animals. When you think of all the terrible destruction that we're, we're doing to the seas, it's so great to see a human do something kind. And it's so great to be a part of this place that is really making a, a difference for all of the ocean. And I'm so grateful to be with like-minded people tonight. It was a real pleasure spending the evening with you. Do we have time for one more question? Well, what new creature, what good creature am I going to write about next? It appears that I, and I haven't even talked to my editor who might be in the room. Um, <laughs> but Kate, if you're here, um, I really want to write about turtles. Yeah, yeah, and I think that they have a lesson for me which might be to slow down a little bit. <laughs> so thank you so much.